Republicans hold a big voter registration advantage in Iowa's 4th Congressional District, but there is a Democrat on the ballot. We'll talk with Democratic Congressional candidate Ryan Melton on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is rooted in Iowa. Elite's 1,600 employees are our company's greatest asset. A family-run business, Elite supports volunteerism, encourages promotions from within, and shares profits with our employees. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating more than 50 years on statewide Iowa PBS. This is the Friday, October 4th edition of Iowa Press. Here is Kay Henderson. Today we begin a series of interviews and debates with candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives. As you likely know, Iowa has four congressional districts. Let's take a look at the fourth district. It is the largest geographically among the four. It encompasses 36 counties and covers much of western, northwestern, and north central Iowa. It includes the cities of Carroll, Council Bluffs, Sioux City, Storm Lake, Spencer, Algona, Fort Dodge, Ames, and Marshalltown. Randy Feenstra, a Republican currently representing the 4th District, did not accept the invitation to a debate on Iowa PBS. So Iowa PBS has invited his challenger to join us on Iowa Press today instead. That is Ryan Melton, a Democrat from Webster City. He holds a master's degree in history and works for a large insurance company. This is his second campaign he ran in 2022. Welcome back to Iowa Press. Glad to be here. Also joining our conversation are Stephen Gruber-Miller of the Des Moines Register and Aaron Murphy of the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. So Ryan, when we talked to you two years ago for that campaign, you said at that time it was never in your life plan to run for political office, and yet here you are uh, again, uh, running again. Why a second try at this? Well, a similar situation last time where uh, there's not a deep bench of folks willing to run. Uh, it's obviously an uphill climb. Uh, one of the more conservative congressional districts in the country. And, you know, I felt, uh, considering we had the same concern in 24 as we did in 22, the fact that I held ha had that robust infrastructure built in 24 that I didn't have in 2022, um, I felt like I was best positioned to fight the good fight on behalf of the people in the 4th. So what do you consider a, a successful campaign, then, if, it, if knowing that victory is a long shot in 2022, you're competitor, Congressman Feenstra, won by more than 102,000 votes, 36 percentage points. What ahead is this, of you, ahead of you. Yeah, yeah, what, what is a successful effort for you? Well, I think we've had a number of successes already. Uh, you know, number one, uh, on the carbon capture pipeline front, uh, when I first campaigned against those pipelines in early 2022, long before most Iowans even knew what they were, Randy Feenstra was very public-facing in his support for them, writing an op-ed in support of them. He's taken tens of thousands of dollars from Bruce Rastetter, the godfather of the Summit Carbon Pipeline. Uh, since I ran robustly uh, on, those, on that issue and have continued to, it's really silenced him um, and has rendered a lot of that money that Rastetter has donated to him moot. Um, that's one example. You know, we've also forced difficult conversations around things like water quality that just simply weren't being had at this level. Uh, the cancer crisis. Um, and ultimately, you know, Randy Feenstra um, was simply going to go without accountability uh, if I hadn't run. And so I know inherently that me running um, was a, a, a boost uh, for democracy and for the voices of the people in our fourth congressional district that would have otherwise gone unheard. So I think we've accomplished a number of great things. The other thing is that I'm really proud of. Uh, of the 25 state house seats we have in our fourth congressional district in 2022, we only had 10 Democrats running for those 25. This time we have 17. 
So I know that this is going to be a mid to long term build, but I've played a role in recruiting those candidates and hopefully building a new direction for the party in our district. So as we mentioned, it's a conservative district. There's about 107,000 more registered Republicans in the district than there are Democrats. How do you talk to those voters and earn their support? And how do you make the case that you're, you would be a better candidate to represent their values than the Republican you're running against? Well, I think the answer to that question is a pretty simple one. I think the fact that uh, Congressman Feenstra's Republican primary challenger, Kevin Virgil, endorsed me um, is really a testament to the fact that there is a path forward uh, in this district. Uh, he, the article he wrote on his ex account uh, about a month ago goes into great detail as to why so many Republican rank and file voters are really upset with Republican Party leadership in this state. Uh, they've been sold out uh, to Bruce Raster. They've been sold out to disproportion, excessive corporate power. And I've talked to so many Republicans. I've been in plenty of rooms full of Republicans in the campaign trail who are ready to make a protest vote. Uh, and I think the Kevin Virgil endorsement of me is really one example of many uh, where the Republican Party leadership in this state have completely abandoned their rank and file. One other thing on that, uh, the entire week after that Kevin Virgil endorsement, Leader after leader from the Iowa Republican Party circled the wagons to attack Virgil, but not one of their social media posts addressed any of the valid concerns Kevin Virgil has regarding the, the, the downward trend of our state under Republican Party leadership, amplifying Kevin Virgil's point in endorsing me. You have, in many respects, made the carbon capture pipeline and your views on it sort of the centerpiece of your campaign. Whereas the Democrats who are running in the first, second, third congressional districts have made abortion the keynote of their campaign. Why? Well, I mean, I talk about reproductive rights, too. I'm certainly a pro-choice candidate, and I think that the six-week abortion ban in this state um, has set us behind um, and has made women in this, con uh, in this congressional district and this state second-class citizens. I think it's horrible. And it's put uh, our medical professionals in impossible positions. But as far as the 4th Congressional District, our Congressional District is where the vast majority of those pipelines will be impacting people. Um, so that in and of itself is a, is a big reason why I've prioritized it. But I also think that the carbon capture pipeline issue is a basic, um, really, attack on fundamental rights that I thought were bipartisan in agreement. Uh, property rights, um, uh, water access and availability, uh, the right to public health, to not waking up in the morning worrying that uh, a carbon capture pipeline is going to fracture underneath your feet and asphyxiate you. Uh, I think these are all very basic things. Uh, and the fact that the Republican Party leadership has completely sold out its rank and file um, to get more big money donations from their corporate handlers, um, again, one of the many reasons why Republican rank and file voters in my district are ready to do something new. You've mentioned clean water a couple times already. The federal farm bill it's sort of in limbo right now. They've temporarily extended the current one and um, we'll have to address it again later this year. Is the status quo sufficient, what's in the federal farm bill for those priorities that you're talking about or what more needs to be I done? think if you talk to water works managers across the state, they'd say the status quo is not sufficient. Um, you know, they are spending massive amounts of money getting the required amount of nitrate out of the drinking water that they give to their citizenry. Um, getting into that 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate federal threshold. So what um, more do we need from the federal government? What do we, should we have in that federal Well, here's the thing. I mean, I, you know, I, I certainly agree uh, that we need to subsidize ag, but we have choice over how we do that. Um, I've talked to plenty of farmers on the ground that know, uh, farmers themselves who know, that the status quo is not working. The fact that we have become the toxic beach advisory state the fact that so many of our folks cannot recreate in our rivers and our lakes and our streams. Um, and so as far as solutions for that, you know, the first thing we need to do um, is we need to get all stakeholders involved at the table. But be very clear that this, where we're at right now, is just simply not working. Um, we, none of us, are happy with the fact um, that every summer we get dozens and dozens and dozens of toxic beach advisories. Um, we're not, none of us are happy with the fact, regardless of political affiliation, with the fact that we have a cancer crisis on our hands and that we have Republican elected officials representing the state in Des Moines and D.C. that are not even willing to acknowledge the problem, much less try to get to the root of the problem and begin mitigating it. Uh, and so the public health concerns are, are massive. Um, we definitely need to do a lot more robust uh, action 
um, as far as incentivizing uh, a number of waterway pollution mitigation strategies and also by default the fact that you talk to any or most agronomists in the state and they'll say we only have 50, 60, 70 years of topsoil left um, before we can't do ag the way we do it now. Um, Clearly, the status quo is falling well short in a wide variety of different ways. So would you support a federal edict in regards to the amount of fertilizer that goes on that topsoil? I, I think that's something we need to explore. Uh, you know, I know that Minnesota, the Minnesota state government, was considering something like that. Mm -hmm. um, we do have plenty of uh, experts in agronomy that have set forth uh, formulas as far as the amount of fertilizer you should be using per uh, uh, land mass. And, uh, I think Iowa State University, their agronomy department, um, uh, developed a formula a few decades back that hasn't really gained as much momentum as I think we'd, we'd want to see. Um, but on top of that, uh, it's not just about um, uh, that context. It's also about the fact that we're continuing to see um, ever more CAFOs uh, in our state. And a lot of folks are really concerned about CAFOs and the fact that you're adding so much more manure to the landscape and yet you have not added more and more mitigation strategies to protect our waterways. We need to sync up the increase with increased protections for public health and for water. Uh, and for safety. those of us who don't know what a CAFO is, that is a... Confined animal fetal operation, okay, right. So uh, th pork, those are, we're talking about pork production. Correct, that's right. I mean, those are springing up more and more and more. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we need to be more responsible when we have a ramp up in industrial ag to also recognize the downstream implications, which, which are many, uh, to public health, uh, to home values, to the hollowing out of our communities, um, to the fact that they are driving sm more and more small and mid-scale farmers off the land. Uh, they are amplifying the fact that we are falling further and further behind our Midwestern neighbors when it comes to per capita household income. A lot of downstream issues there. So. Over the summer, Northwest Iowa was hit hard by devastating flooding. We've seen the news in recent weeks in the eastern part of the country about Hurricane Helene. What policies do you think you would support at the federal level to improve the resiliency of communities so that they can withstand disasters like this in the future? Well, there's a very easy one that's very unique to our congressional district, and that's the fact that for four years in a row, my opponent, Randy Feenstra, has literally asked for zero dollars and zero cents um, of uh, community improvement earmark uh, money for our uh, district. Um, and as a state, uh, we have more bridges in need of repair, for example, than any other in the country. Most of the quality of life indicators that are backsledding in Iowa are worse in our fourth congressional district. Just this year alone, the other three U.S. House Republicans representing the state asked for a collective $115 million of that community improvement earmark money for things like flood mitigation, water projects, infrastructure. Um, so that's a simple one. If I'm elected... Um, I would recognize that it is absolutely illogical that the residents of our fourth congressional district are paying federal tax money, and yet they have a representative in Congress that is just leaving that money on the table when we are in dire need of money. The fact that with those floods, you had so many people worried about levy uh, dam uh, failures, um, the fact we've had so much damage, and you have a congressman that's leaving so much money on the table that we need. Is, is that enough for just requesting that money, or are there other solutions? Oh, you think certainly that's not, that's not the only thing, but that's the easy, low-hanging fruit that uh, to this day blows my mind that Feenster just completely um, just neglects to bring back home. Um, gosh, I mean, I, I'm certainly a big supporter of infrastructure bills. The bipartisan infrastructure bill I thought was great. There's a massive number of projects that are now funded in our fourth congressional district as part of that bill. I think also uh, the fact that we continue to see um, Republican legislators take cl uh, claim credit for projects happening in their communities that uh, were funded by infrastructure bills that they voted against. You know, Randy Feenstra uh, was up uh, at the Lewis and Clark Waterworks uh, ribbon cutting up in northwest Iowa, voted against the, the infrastructure bill that gave it its final financial boost. And so there's a lot of disingenuousness around these kinds of things. And um, I think we need to shed a lot more light on that. For the benefit of our viewers, before I ask this next question, we're having this conversation on Friday morning, and I want to ask you about the Middle East. In other words, something could happen between now and the time somebody looks at your comments here. What, in, as a member of the U.S. House, would you do in regards to U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East? Would you vote to go to war? No. Um, so I've been on the record about this. I've been very public about this. Um, while, uh, Hamas is horrible. 
and any, everything that can be done that still respects the dignity of the Palestinian folks uh, in Gaza, in the West Bank, anything in that context should be done to try to rid Hamas, uh, or rid Palestine of Hamas. However, um, I have been on the record as saying um, that we should not be providing offensive military funding to Netanyahu considering the status quo of how he's conducting his operation there. I think he's making an already horrible situation. October 7th was absolutely horrible, indefensible. Uh, but I think Netanyahu has really amplified problems here and has played into the hands of Hamas by giving them so much uh, advertising on the fact that there have been tens of thousands of Palestinians that have lost their lives. Uh, the dropping of non-precision -pre uh, munitions upon densely populated areas while Hamas fighters were in the tunnels, unscathed from those uh, big bomb drops. Um, I have not hesitated in my concern that we are funding an operation that is killing tens of thousands of innocents. And I would also say, um, it is, I, I, don't, I think it's hard for anyone to really put together a, a robust argument that what Netanyahu, what Netanyahu is doing in Palestine is increasing the likelihood that Israelis will have a longer lasting peace as well. And if you look at what's happening in Israel, the citizenry, the citizenry there are very unhappy with Netanyahu. They've wanted him out of there for quite a long time. And the fact that Netanyahu continues to add fuel to the fire here and amplify without concern um, uh, for the well-being of, uh, of the civilians on the ground, I don't think that's something we should be supporting you financially. Me you mentioned Hamas. You haven't mentioned Hezbollah. Well, sure. I mean, I, I guess my view, I mean, Hezbollah is obviously a horrible organization as well. There's no question about that. Um, but the question again is, is, is the person on the Israeli side that's leading the offensive cognizant and sufficiently concerned about minimizing civilian casualty? And his track record pretty clearly since October 7th has been no. Um, and I think the fact that we are still providing offensive military funding and it feels like we are not in a place uh, as, a, as far as a federal government infrastructure to robustly point out the obvious, which is how are we providing Palestinians or Israelis long-lasting peace when we're killing, when we're aiding in the killing of tens of thousands of innocent folks, many of them children? How is that benefiting our any long-term goal as far as long-term peace? And also Netanyahu has been on the record as saying he's not in support of a two-state solution. Uh, Biden, uh, Harris are in favor of a two-state solution. Um, and so as long as Netanyahu is giving, is, is receiving massive amounts of financial aid from us and his goals are not aligned with ours and he is amplifying the concern in the Middle East, I just don't see how you can reconcile those things. I've been very public about my concern there. Very quick before we move on because I just want to, I'm curious to hear, whenever people um, give a, a, a an opinion like that, I, I, you, you hear the pushback that anything less than a full-throated endorsement of Israel and full backing of Israel and its, an right, ally, to exist. And its right to exist is, is unacceptable and a betrayal of an ally uh, of the U.S. I'm just curious. Your I right. just strongly disagree with that. Um, a lot of Israeli citizens would, would disagree with that. Um, I am all about long-lasting peace for both Israelis and Palestinians. If you look at what the, the, the folks in Israel are saying uh, regarding Netanyahu, they are incredibly unhappy and concerned that Netanyahu's conduct of this operation is making it less likely to have long-lasting peace and security. So I think you can ask legitimate questions and levy uh, legitimate criticisms of what Netanyahu is doing while still being an advocate of long-lasting peace for both Israelis and Speaking Palestinians. Speaking of questions. Yeah, so, so the Register's Iowa poll found that Iowans consider immigration a top issue in this election. Your opponent, Congressman Feenstra, says immigration is his top issue. What conversations are you having with voters about immigration? What do you think needs to be done? Well, I, I think it's more complicated than that. So when Donald Trump before the Iowa Republican caucus said that immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country, which is a horrible thing to say, um, there was a journalist, and I, I forget what outlet they were with, um, before the Iowa Republican caucus, they went up to farm owners in northwest Iowa that hire migrant labor, and they showed them that clip. Um, most of these Republicans and the journalists asked those folks if they agreed with that sentiment. And to a T, they said no. Uh, that the immigrants that they hired are amazing people, hardworking folks who just want to provide for their families, right? Um, we, data point after data point after data point shows 
that regardless of or despite what Donald Trump says, where he depicts immigrants as criminals, um, as violent, um, the data shows that's not true. I mean, the data shows that both documented and undocumented immigrants to this country commit crime at much lower rates than native-born citizens do. Um, so let's get that out there. I'm not going to be involved in the fear-mongering that has dominated that space. Now, beyond that, uh, I've been in favor and have advocated for publicly um, a robust immigrant labor program where you have to have much more robust federal and state coordination to align migrant flow with labor need. In Northwest Iowa, we are finding it very difficult to find the workers we need to make our communities run. There's a reason why there is a rollback, an unconstitutional rollback of child labor protection laws in this state because we are really struggling with brain drain, we're struggling with worker shortage. Um, I would argue, having my, <laughs> my historical background, uh, we have had robust immigrant labor programs in the past where federal and state coordination align those flows with labor need. We certainly need to make sure that communities that absorb that labor um, are ready to do so, that they have the sufficient housing stock they need and other amenities, because we have seen some situations with that lack of robust federal to state coordination where communities have been a bit overburdened and they've seen some stress there. So we need we need to, a lot a lot to improve in that space for sure. And before we move, just have a few minutes left and some other issues. Just quick before we move on, there was a bill, a compromise bill in, in the in Congress that was ultimately not voted on. Would you would you have voted for that immigration bill? You know, I've got to say, I, I think that considering there is bipartisan support for it, um, considering the fact that uh, there has been a, a decent amount of stress on our communities, um, I, I, I probably would have voted for it, but I would have added or introduced my own amendments um, to allow for such things as a robust immigrant labor program, per, per what I mentioned. You know, with bills that come in front of you in Congress, there's no such thing as a perfect bill. Um, and I certainly don't uh, want to support anything that lends to a vilification of immigrants because they don't deserve that. Um, but clearly we have a need for a much more robust immigrant reform uh, uh, than what we've been seeing. Um, and I think that even though we've had a lot of great success stories uh, around our fourth congressional district as far as immigrants coming in and rejuvenating a lot of towns that have been dying and struggling due to this decades long hollowing out, um, it is clear we need guardrails. You know, we need more um, same page common ground guidance between state and federal authorities to make this as seamless as we can. Yeah, we just have a couple minutes left. I want to ask about taxes. Yep. The Trump administration's tax cuts are set to expire at the end of 2025 unless Congress takes action. Is there any part of those tax cuts that you would vote to keep? Well, I, I, you know, I've done a lot of research on that. I've talked to a lot of folks on that. And to me, the, tax, the Trump tax cuts uh, really feel like a robbery of the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. taxpayer. Um, we already have a massive wealth gap in this country a massive amount of wealth hoarding in this country. Uh, while tens of millions of folks are living in poverty, um, while 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, um, I'm not a fan of the Trump tax cuts. Um, I think you do need to be mindful uh, of any potential impact to the business community. But I will say, uh, and I'm not anti-corporate when I say something like this, but I think it's just reasonable um, that in our current climate, where you have company after company, industry after industry raking in record profit, um, while we, uh, on our backs, there's an awful lot of issues with greedflation, and there's a, an awful lot of hesitancy um, in Congress to robustly push back on this price gouging that we've been seeing. And I think a lot of that is is because they are, there's so much power and so much money in the corporate space, and that corporate power has corrupted the political space. Um, and these Trump tax cuts just gave the wealthiest more money uh, and the biggest corporations more power to leverage and to hurt the rest of us on the ground. So um, I'm certainly not a fan of the Trump tax cuts and don't think they should be extended you in current form. You mentioned greedflation. We have about a minute left. Inflation has been something that your opponent, Congressman Feenster, has been talking about. He's an advocate of a balanced federal budget. Um, do you think the federal budget should be balanced? I think that's a goal we should eventually reach. Uh, we should we should work toward. I mean, you know, Democratic administration after Democratic administration have been uh, pretty darn successful historically in modern history um, in, in building in building surpluses. Um, I think what's unfortunate is is a Randy Feenstra talks about things like inflation, but he supports the Trump tax cuts that amplified the wealth gap. 
Um, he fought against um, the bulking up of the IRS to, to go after the wealthiest tax cheats. Um, he in no way would ever mention greedflation as a concern. He would in no way mention a windfall tax uh, to clamp down on greedflation during times of inflation. Um, and he voted against a bill that was in the U.S. House that would have helped us address price gouging in oil and gas. So he's all talk, but he hasn't had the action to, to back it up. I have to end our conversation there. Thanks, Ryan Melton, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Iowa Press, Iowa PBS, will be hosting two congressional district debates in the coming weeks. On Monday, October 14th, the second congressional district debate between Sarah Corkery and Ashley Henson. And the first congressional district debate will be Monday, August 21st, with Christina Bohannon and Marionette Miller Meeks. Watch both debates live at 8 p.m. on Iowa PBS. For everyone here at Iowa PBS, thanks for watching today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Elite Casino Resorts is a family-run business rooted in Iowa. We believe our employees are part of our family, and we strive to improve their quality of life and the quality of lives within the communities we serve. Across Iowa, hundreds of neighborhood banks strive to serve their communities, provide jobs, and help local businesses. Iowa banks are proud to back the life you build. Learn more at iowabankers.com.